Now in this practical, we've been looking at the physiology of structures which are too small to see with the naked eye. And so what I wanted to do in this video is to diagrammatically represent the mechanisms that we've been having a look at so that we can have a think about how the structures and events, including the axons, the action potentials, the stimulating electrodes and recording electrodes relate to these traces, this data that we've been having a look at on the screen. And so first of all, this is our nerve sitting on our tissue bath. On the left, we've got two stimulating electrodes and on the right, we've got two recording electrodes. Now if we just draw a rough diagram of this from the side, then we've got our nerve sitting on top of our electrodes. And then we'll just expand the nerve vertically a bit so we can have a bit more space. And let's put some horizontal lines on this diagram to represent the axons which run down the length of this nerve. Now the compound action potentials that we're seeing in the lab chart window on the screen occur because of what's been detected at the recording electrodes. So let's have a closer look at the recording electrodes to see how we measure a compound action potential. Now even more diagrammatically, in their resting state, axons are negatively charged on the inside of the axon compared to the outside. And so the outside of axons tend to be more positively charged. The recording electrodes that we use to measure compound action potentials are external electrodes, so they can't actually see anything that's occurring inside the axons. All they can detect is the environment on the outside of these axons. Now the trace that we see on the screen is just the difference in charge between these two recording electrodes. So in the resting state, when both electrodes are in the same sort of environment, then there's no difference between the charge between these two recording electrodes and so therefore the response that we see on the screen is flat, as shown here at the start of our trace before we've stimulated the nerve. Now when we stimulate the nerve and send action potentials along the axons, initially after the stimulus, the recording electrodes are still unchanged. But eventually, the action potentials arrive at the first of the recording electrodes. Now just remember what an action potential is. So during an action potential, voltage-gated sodium channels open, allowing sodium to run down its concentration gradient from the outside of the axons to the inside of the axons. So therefore, around the region of the axons where the action potentials are occurring, the axons become relatively negatively charged since the sodium ions that were on the outside have now rushed into the axon. The recording electrodes, remember, are external, so all they can detect is what's going on on the outside of the axons. And so this relative negativity around the outside of that first recording electrode is now different in charge to what is experienced by the second recording electrode. Now we've set the software to deflect upwards when the first recording electrode detects this charge change due to the action potentials. And so when the action potentials arrive at the first recording electrode, we get this upwards deflection on the screen as shown here. Now the action potentials don't just stop at the first recording electrode, they'll keep travelling down the axons. Soon, the action potentials will have moved between the recording electrodes and the axons they pass through will have reset, and so the two recording electrodes will again be in similar charge environments. And you can see this as the deflection on the trace again coming back down to the baseline level. Now the action potentials will of course eventually get to the second recording electrode and the relative negativity on the outside of the axons will be detected by that recording electrode and cause a deflection, this time in the opposite direction. So again because of the way we've got the software set up, the deflection will be downwards instead of upwards. Lastly, the action potentials will then move beyond both recording electrodes and the axons will reset, and so both recording electrodes will again be in similar charge environments. This can be seen on the screen as the trace again returning to baseline. Now that we understand what's causing the deflections that we're seeing on the screen, let's have a closer look at what we are seeing in a compound action potential. Let's go back to our diagram of the nerve. We can stimulate the nerve enough to get a single action potential which will then run down the length of the nerve across the recording electrodes. Now let's include the deflections that we will see on the screen at the same time. Okay, now let's slow that down just a bit so we can see what's happening. 
So we stimulate the nerve. And then when the action potential reaches the first of the recording electrodes, because of the way we set up the software, we see a deflection upwards. So hopefully that makes sense now. Then the action potential reaches the second recording electrode, and we see a deflection in the opposite direction, giving us this trace that we see on the screen. Now if we increase our stimulus a little bit, so we've got two action potentials running along the nerve. Let's have a look at what happens. So those action potentials will run across the recording electrodes just like they did before, only now the deflections look a little bit different. We can see that the deflections, in other words the magnitude of charge difference at the recording electrodes, are larger when there are more action potentials present at those recording electrodes. So in other words, the compound action potentials that we see are simply the sum of the charge difference of all the action potentials at each of those recording electrodes. Now the nerve we're looking at is the sciatic nerve, and the sciatic nerve is a very large mixed nerve, meaning that it carries lots of different fibre types. Now all those different fibre types are going to have different diameters, and they have different levels of myelination, and so therefore they have different conduction velocities. Some examples, for example, the very big ones are the alpha motor neurons and the stretch receptors, which have very large diameters and have very fast conduction velocities. Some of the touch fibres, the A-beta fibres, they're sort of an intermediate sort of size, uh, have intermediate levels of myelination and sort of have a slightly lower conduction velocity. Even lower again, you've got A-delta fibres, so some of the pain fibres and some cold thermoceptors, for example, are A-delta fibres. They're even smaller and therefore have a smaller conduction velocity. And then you have fibres like C-fibres for some types of pain and for warm thermoception, which are very small diameter, have no myelin and have a very slow conduction velocity. So if we do a large stimulus strength now, we're activating most of the axons across the nerve, and so all of those action potentials in all of those different fibre types are going to run down their axons and arrive at the recording electrodes, just like we saw before. But now this is the important bit. Because all of those action potentials were running at different conduction velocities, all of those action potentials are going to arrive at the recording electrodes at slightly different times. So the fastest fibres are of course going to arrive at the recording electrodes first, and so that first part of the deflection that we see on our traces in the lab chart window are due to the action potentials in these fastest fibres reaching the recording electrodes. Next, the action potentials continue to arrive at the recording electrodes, and the bulk of these action potentials have now arrived, and so you see the peak amplitude of our response in the lab chart window. Now here's where things also start to get a little bit more complicated. So we can see that although the bulk of the action potentials are just arriving at the first of the recording electrodes, we can see that the fastest action potentials have already arrived at the second of the recording electrodes. Now just bear in mind, we've got the software set up so that action potentials at the first recording electrode deflect upwards, but action potentials being detected by the second recording electrodes deflect downwards. And so what do you think is going to happen to the compound action potential due to these action potentials at both of the recording electrodes at once? Now I'm going to leave that to you to have a bit of a think about, but let's have a look at the next step now. Here we can see that most of the action potentials have now passed the first recording electrode, and even more of them are at the second recording electrode. The action potentials that are arriving at the first recording electrode are of course the action potentials from the slowest fibres. And so this last part of the compound action potential is actually a measurement of the slowest action potentials in these fibres. Then eventually all of the action potentials will have passed the first recording electrode, and so the bulk of action potentials are now at the second recording electrode, leaving the deflection to be entirely downwards. And so you get this second phase of a biphasic compound action potential. And then eventually all of the action potentials have passed both recording electrodes and the trace returns to baseline. And so let's have a look at that one more time. And so now hopefully you have a better understanding of the actual physical events that are occurring which give rise to the trace that you're seeing on the screen during each of the activities in this practical.